Hi folks, I am Seamus Brannigan, principal author on the paper A Secure Algorithm for Rounded Gaussian Sampling, a paper produced by myself, Maya O'Neill, Aisha Khalid and Kira Rafferty. We are from the Centre for Secure Information Technologies at Queen's University Belfast. So the focus of this paper is one small component of one method of post-quantum cryptography, known as lattice-based cryptography. Um, post-quantum cryptography is an essential area of research due to the fact that Peter Shore published a paper which simultaneously solved the prime factorization problem of large integers in polynomial time and also the discrete logarithm problem in polynomial time. So this has huge ramifications on our current public key algorithms. So we can say goodbye to RSA and elliptic curves and we can say hello to lattice-based cryptography, code-based cryptography, hash-based cryptography, multivariate-based cryptography and isogeny-based cryptography. So quantum computing will have huge ramifications on the world, but it's not without its competition. So a lattice consists of a basis, which is a set of vectors from which every other vector in the lattice can be generated. If we look to the left, we'll see two sets of basis vectors. The basis vectors in red are somewhat close to orthogonal and short, whereas the vectors in black are less orthogonal and longer. Generally in lattice-based cryptography the secret key will consist of a set of basis vectors such as the ones in red which are orthogonal, uh, close to orthogonal and short whereas the public key will consist of longer, less orthogonal basis vectors. So the entire lattice then consists of all integer linear combinations of the basis vectors. So most lattice schemes involve sampling random vectors and if we have a vector, whether it be a lattice vector or some vector in between lattice points, we can reduce the vector to its equivalent in the fundamental parallelepiped. The fundamental parallelepiped is shown in the bottom left diagram in the darker blue. So Uniformly sampling these vectors can leak information about the basis because if we sample enough vectors in the lattice such that we then reduce them to the fundamental parallelepiped, we eventually fill in the parallelepiped itself and that can be used to infer the basis vectors which form the fundamental parallelepiped. So Gaussian sampling is one way in which this problem is mitigated. So we discuss the state of the art in Gaussian sampling and the state of the art in this paper and presentation is taken to be the Nuthiao bit slicing algorithm by Karmakar et al. Other developments have been made in Gaussian sampling, however, to reach performances greater than the Nuthiao set up in this paper, they require the use of vectorized instructions and um, platform dependent code. So we compare with the most efficient generic algorithm 
which is the Nuthio. So the Nuthio algorithm is a random walk on a binary tree. The binary tree is set up such that once you traverse the tree with uniform samples taking a different direction depending on the sample you will eventually end up at a value which is distributed according to a Gaussian distribution. So the new theo with bit slicing is constant time and cache attack resistant. So Despite the fact that Nuthio is efficient and lightweight for low standard deviation, the time and memory complexity grows as standard deviation is increased. So to get around this, the state-of-the-art method is to use the Nuthio algorithm in conjunction with the michiancho walter method for um, convolution. So this allows you to draw several samples from low standard deviation and combine them to a sample with higher standard deviation. So it requires a base sampler which can be any sampler however the one we compare to is the Nuthio with bit slicing. So the Michiancho Walter method requires two to the power of i calls to the base sampler, where i is the ceiling of log to the base two of log to the base two of sigma. The Michiancho Walter convolution addresses the issue of the explosions in time and memory complexity in the Nuthio for achieving high standard deviation. However, there is still an increase in the complexity with respect to standard deviation, and that's what motivates the work of this paper. So we need to use the Michiancho Walter convolution when sampling high standard deviation with the Nuthio method, but also when sampling distributions centered between integers. So two separate processes must happen for the most generic arbitrary distributions and there is a, an increase in the time complexities for this. So it is worth investigating certain methods which can reach high standard deviation and arbitrary center with simpler transformations and no increase in the time complexity. So one method of doing this is using a continuous Gaussian distribution whereas the Nuthio is a discrete Gaussian distribution method. If we sample from a continuous distribution then what we can do is simply transform a sample from a low standard deviation by multiplying by the sigma and adding the center. Sampling continuous Gaussians and rounding the result to an integer was proven secure in lattice-based constructions by Hulsing et al. So the use of these continuous distributions is known to be secure. We choose as the continuous Gaussian sampling method the Box-Muller transformation, which is a transformation from two uniformly generated values U1 and U2 to two Gaussian distributed values V1 and V2. 
The first factor and common term in both expressions is a complete reversal of the Gaussian function. And the second factors are the cos and sine of the second uniform value multiplied by 2 pi. And this gives us two values which are distributed according to a Gaussian distribution. It's a good sampling method to choose for the use case of cryptography because it is inherently constant time. All that remains to be done is to ensure that the transcendental functions, the cos, sine, square root and natural log are all implemented in constant time. The method we chose to evaluate the transcendental functions of the Box-Muller algorithm was the Cordic family of algorithms and this is chosen because it readily evaluates all of the Box-Muller functions. The Cordic family of algorithms involve coordinate rotations of vectors to approximate the functions and each variation of the family can be categorized in two ways. So each individual algorithm from the Cordic family will need to select a geometry and a mode of operation. For the geometry we can have the circular or Euclidean geometry where the radius remains constant during rotation, hyperbolic where the radius follows a saddle or linear where the radius follows a vertical line. For the mode of operation we have rotation where the vector begins on the x-axis and is rotated towards a final vector in a quadrant or we have vectoring where the vector begins in a quadrant and is rotated towards the x-axis. So in rotation mode we begin with a vector v0 on the x-axis. We rotate this vector, vector towards the final vector vn. On subsequent rotations we decrease the amount by which we rotate and if the vector passes the final vector we reverse the direction, thus we converge upon the final vector. In vectoring mode the same process occurs whereby we converge upon the final vector except this time the final vector is on the x-axis and the initial vector is in the quadrant. Rotation mode drives theta to zero whereas vectoring mode drives y to zero. In evaluating cos theta and sine theta from Cordic in circular rotation mode, we initialize x0 to be 1 over k sub n, where k sub n will be explained in a little bit. y sub 0 is initialized to 0 because the initial vector is on the x-axis and z0 is a stand-in for theta. So on the left we have the transformations which are made to the x, y and theta variables in the i plus 1th iteration of Cordic. The delta sub i variable is what controls the direction of the rotation and also the amount by which it's rotated or the factor of the alternate x or y variable which is rotated. m is particular to the geometry so in the case of circular geometry m equals 1 and given that x and y have rotated by the amounts given the angle that will have been traversed by this rotation is alpha sub i equals tan, the inverse tan of delta i. So x, the x and y transformations will not be full proper rotations, they're in fact pseudo rotations because the radius is not preserved in this case. The 
fact that we are reducing delta sub i by a half each time just allows us to right shift instead of a multiply and it would be um, impossible to have actual rotations without a multiplication in there somewhere. So with these pseudo rotations we need a way of tracking the radius to preserve it at the end and that is done with the k variable. In calculating the square root and natural log in using Cordic in hyperbolic factoring mode, we initialize x to be a plus 1 and y to be a minus 1, where a is the argument to the function that we wish to evaluate. Notice, however, that in box Muller we need to calculate the natural log first and then take the square root of the result of that. So we cannot simultaneously calculate both the square root and the natural log as we could for the cos and the sine. Again, the transformations. But notice that now m equals minus 1, which is the correct parameter for hyperbolic geometry. And this means that the x and the y are now transformed in the same direction, whereas in the circular rotation mode they were transformed in opposite directions. And again, because the geometry is now hyperbolic, the tan becomes hyperbolic tan. The radius preserving quantity k is the same as before. As the domain of convergence is limited, we reduce the domain and restore the range. So we have an input value and we pre-process it. We input the result of that into the Cordic algorithm and then we do some post-processing on the result. So for natural log we bring the value into the range 0.5 to 1. We input that value into the Cordic and then we're able to find the result that it would have been had the reduction not taken place. A similar thing happens for the square root except there's a slight variation when um, the amount to shift by to bring it into the 0 0.5 to 1 range is odd. We take advantage of the periodicity of cos and sine so we calculate cos and sine in the restricted range of 0 to pi over 2 and we then take advantage of the periodicity and restore the value to what it would be in any of the other three quadrants. So to secure the Cordic algorithm we use multi-precision fixed point data types in the form of unsigned 64-bit integer arrays and we represent booleans as uint32 types where the least significant bit is either a 0 or a 1. We make good use of some widely known cryptographic operations, so operations which carry out otherwise non-constant time operations in constant time. So for example we have the constant time is non-zero and this tests whether x is not zero. If it is not zero the answer is one and it does this by using the fact that the two's complement of a value can only differ in the most significant bit from the original value 
unless that value is zero. A similar application is made in the constant time is not equal, which tests whether x and y are not equal. So x minus y and y minus x are the two's complement of each other, and hence their most significant bits must differ unless they are equal. And the right shift just brings the most significant bit that we're operating on into the least significant bit, which aligns with our use of Boolean values. For the less than function, we have that we XOR X and Y to see if their most significant bits are equal. We OR this value with whether Y and X minus Y have equal most significant bits. And this gives us a most significant bit, which must be different from that of X if X is less than Y. We also have a select function which chooses X or Y depending on whether the bit is 0 or 1. And we do this with a simple masking. In order to carry out Cordic in a constant time and side channel resistant way, we must carry out the transformations using the same operations independent of which direction the vector is rotating. So this amounts to carrying out an addition and subtraction with only an addition or subtraction operation. So we use separate uint32 variables to keep a track of a variable's sign, whether it's negative, positive, and sometimes positive and greater than one. These variables are then used as a control for a conditional function which converts the number to add or subtract to its two's complement depending on which operation must be performed. So this is the function which adjusts the rotation to make sure that a value is in its two complement form or not. So it can be added or subtracted to produce an addition or subtraction. So this is the first part of the cos and sine function which uses the circular rotation mode of Cordic. And we see that there are some edge cases when we use this two's complement form of addition and subtraction. When the final vector is very close to either the x-axis or the y-axis, the rotating vector can overflow into a quadrant which results in either the x being negative or the y being negative. And this has ramifications on our ability to use the two's complement. If you look at lines 8 and 9 where the right shift is performed, we must adjust either side of this in lines 7 and 10 to make sure that we are not right shifting a two's complement. Furthermore, it complicates the logic for working out whether a variable must be converted to its two's complement. The rather convoluted logic shown in the algorithm in the right is summarized by the table of Boolean values in the middle. 
We now turn to the performance and memory results for the new Theo Michiancho Walter setup and our own Box Muller via Cordic. We've investigated the results for increased sigma, so standard deviation parameter, but we note that the Nuthiao Michiancho Walter setup has only been estimated based on the number of calls to the underlying Nuthiao algorithm. There will be further overhead from the glue code which binds those calls together to make an actual sample. We also note that for the most arbitrary distributions, those which are centered between integers, that it will require another process similar to that for reaching high standard deviation. So for the most arbitrary distributions, the Nuthiao Michiancher Walter setup will require more overhead. We'd like to also point out that many optimizations exist for Cordic and can be ready, readily applied to our secured version we opted for the most basic form of Cordic to get it secured first of all, but optimizations exist which can, for example, reduce the number of iterations by a half by varying the radix. So, in conclusion, we suggest that at the very least the box Muller and continuous Gaussian sampling is a fruitful avenue to explore for Gaussian sampling for lattice based signatures, particularly where the distribution required is centered between integers and has a high standard deviation. This concludes our talk. Thanks.